Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the Catalyst webinar series presented by the Education Committee for the Southern California PGA. The Catalyst webinar series is a bi-weekly educational platform for creating success and change in your club and career. We have the 2020 Golf Professional of the Year at the section level, Mr. Rob Osterhaus. He is the GM and COO at the illustrious Sherwood Country Club up in Thousand Oaks. And uh, delighted to have him on the Catalyst this morning. He's going to be presenting on uh, food and beverage from the golf professional's point of view who doesn't know anything about food and beverage. Kind of a candid uh, title there, but uh, very important. And as we all know, uh, food and beverage it can be, from a golf professional standpoint, from anybody's standpoint, could be the most challenging aspect of consistently offering uh, high-end service at a uh, at uh, at your club, Mr. Osterhaus. Good morning. Thanks for being on the Catalyst today. Thanks, John. Uh, always good to see you online again and uh, be part of this. Love you know, education is near and dear to my heart, and so I'm, I love doing this stuff and looking forward to the next one already. Um, so yeah, let's John. As John said, just a kind of a candid approach to the fact that a lot of us you know got into the business and we didn't have a lot of food and beverage experience and some of you on the call today might have might not have any um you know frankly for me um with my you know day-to-day -day job when you know in terms of balancing you know human resources finance um, housekeeping golf maintenance golf operations tennis you know all the other little odds and ends that we you know fitness spa that we have at our club you know, I really enjoy food and beverage uh, to a great deal. You know, I think one one of the things I've realized is just it, it's it, how much it impacts everybody. I'll, I'll touch, touch on that here and again in a second. But uh, just want to, I really want to, this is a really broad view on a lot of things and sort of just to get you thinking and maybe get you uh, reaching out to other people that you know in the industry that, you know, are food and beverage experts or the food and beverage experts at your facility or the people who are involved in, and just to be part of it. Um, you know, I think, as John said, it's such an important part of all of our facilities in, in different ways. And again, we'll talk about that. It doesn't matter how big of a facility you have in terms of your food and beverage operation. It, it's impactful and it's meaningful. So let's just start going through the slides here. And so why, you know, again, why are we talking about it today? Well, the tension on food and beverage is, is higher than ever. Um, you know, from my from my standpoint, it's, you know, especially in well, where we are in Southern California and I think all over the state, but, you know, there's how you're doing your food and beverage now is important from a safety aspect, from a what can you produce aspect. You know, when we, when the pandemic started, you know, we shut down immediately for a day and then really by the next day we realized, okay, well, we can do to-go food. And then it was, okay, well, when can we have some dining outdoors and then was indoors and then it was back to outdoors. And so again, there's a lot of, a lot of attention put on food and beverage for, for different reasons now, but just on the, on the good side, um, I think for most of the, hopefully most of you on this call, it's definitely the case here at Sherwood where our golf rounds are up 40%. I think, you know, big thing, it's a safe, safe activity for people and people aren't traveling like they used to, at least out of the, out of the state. And so, You've got a lot of a lot of golfers. Um, you've also got a lot of new golfers, or maybe even returning golfers. People who haven't haven't been uh, that active in the game at all, active or that active in the game. Um, you know, I've been, you know, in Arizona and down in the desert and um, in Northern California over the last about two months, and it's unbelievable just talking to people at private clubs and you know playing at a couple uh, public facilities as well. Just thinking, you know, these are the places where you could usually just walk on in the afternoon and it's, you know, the tea times are incredible. Uh, just locally here in, uh, you know, around us uh, in Simi Valley, you know, we've got a I mean, public course there, Simi Hills and then Sinaloa par three course and getting tea times. I was trying to get a tea time for my wife and my children and I the other day. Not easy. Uh, it's, it's crazy. Lindero Country Club, same thing. Um, you know, nine hole executive course locally here, tried to go play and it was got a tee time, but it was one group after another you know, getting out there. So great. And, you know, again, one of the silver linings of what's going on, but, you know, with all those, all those golfers come, you know, expectations, especially the new golfers where I'm going out to do something that's fun and social. They're not looking to be competitive. So, 
you know, what's a big part of being social is the is the food and beverage aspect. So you've got to keep that in mind as you're, you know, with all these new 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 rounds of and the new golfers is what are they expecting when they come to your facility? Um, we'll talk about, you know, brand and, and expectations more as we go along. Another another reason why, you know, really this is important to me is because I want everybody to you know, get past, or you and your, all your careers to get past the stigma of golf professionals don't know about food and beverage. Um, I'm not going to say it's easy because there's a lot of lot of moving parts to food and beverage, but I will say there are a lot of parallels to the golf business and food and beverage business. And we'll, we'll touch on some of those a little bit later on. And, and again, I just want to say this is a really broad view of of food and beverage. Um, I, you know, I I was trying to come up with, you know, figure out what the right number of slides was. And I mean, I could have a hundred slide deck if we wanted to. I think there's, you know, there's a lot of opportunity for us to do more food and beverage. Um, you know, I was going to talk to John later on about it, but I mean, you can really break down as minuscule as you want and granular in detail because there's so much interesting stuff out there. Also, for it's an opportunity for you to differentiate yourself. And what I mean by differentiate yourself is you yourself as the golf professional with the, that knowledge and differentiate your facility maybe from some of the other opportunities that, uh, you know, options that people are thinking about doing and, or maybe a, from the, your, one of your golf course competitors. I, I think it's really, you know, these, those last two points tying to the next one is creating career opportunities. I know for me, when I was really trying to, you know, move up in my career, I realized how important that food and beverage was. And so I was lucky that I got um, some really good service training and, and menu development training while I was at Four Seasons. And then when I went to work at uh, JC Resorts in San Diego for JC Golf and really understanding more about the business of food and beverage, that for me was one of the biggest you know, dif differentiators for me when I would, could talk intelligently about the business of food and beverage. And again, that, that goes into the next point of enhancing your credibility and marketability. So who's your, you know, who are you trying to be credible to? Your staff that you're managing, the, maybe you're managing a food and beverage, um, you've got a food and beverage supervisor or manager who reports to you or a, a chef or some cooks, whoever those people might be, you know, you want to make sure that you're things in food and beverage to agronomy. So when you're talking to a super, and then, you know, I, I don't know that much about grass and turf, and, but I need to learn and I need to have a, a broad understanding so that I can help that person. I can empathize with them. I can help brainstorm. Again, I'm not going to be out there making agronomic plans, but I should be able to, to really contribute to that conversation and, and, you know, be, be an important, um, you know, be an important contributing factor as you make decisions that way. And again, the marketability is, again, trying to, whether it's trying to position yourself for a, the next step job, you know, job comes open at your facility or a next step job somewhere else, or you're negotiating for, you know, a, a wage increase. It's just something else you want to put on there that's, that you can say, I understand this. This is what I do. You can show, you know, again, it's another thing you can show with metrics to, you know, whether it's a board of governors, whether it's a municipal government that you're working, that you're negotiating with, whether it's a, you know, your director of golf or, or the owner of the facility or whoever it might be, just you want to make sure that you, you know, again, it's something else you can sort of put on your resume. The next point is, you know, it's, it's, we, uh, there's a term that goes around that I've heard from time to time is that readers are leaders. And meaning that if you read, you learn, you're growing. I think the same thing is, applies to eating, um, and as well as drinking. That you, the more you, the more you have diversity in how you, you know, eat and drink and dine out and and consume. And I don't even consume in terms of eating and drinking, but consume in terms of reading about food and beverage and watching. There's so there's so much content on TV right now. Uh, you know, for me, it's sometimes I just like background noise, and a lot of times that's background noise is the food network when I'm at my house. So, you know, you, you see what other people are doing around the country. Um, again, I think it's, it's very easy to, uh, very easy to, you know, to take in, um, you know, again, I'd start with the food network guy Fieri. He's got some great programming, um, especially when he's driving around and he might be in your part of the world and, or he might be stopping, you know, doing some, you know, seeing something that, you know, you could apply to your facility. So again, there's so much content out there. It's a lot of fun, and again, you you just it 
you get little bits and pieces. You're not, you know, you're not trying to write a college dissertation, but you're trying to pick up one or two pieces of information with anything you do. And then again, today we want to try to put some of these things into terms that that you'll understand or you can relate to. And the last thing is, it, it really is fun. Uh, it's it's challenging because you know, there's you're dealing with, you know, again, it's very much like you're dealing with a you know a golf course superintendent when people are rating you on your food and beverage. It's very subjective. You know, it's not it's one thing when you're dealing with numbers or you're playing around a round of golf. You know, it took me four hours and 20 minutes or took me three hours and 45 minutes. That's very objective. But when you're term, in terms of food and beverage, for the most part, it's almost completely subjective. You know, how was your meal? It's, it's really up to the, the individual who's talking about it, but it's, it's a lot of fun. I think you'll, you'll really grow from this. And I think you'll, you'll really add value to you, you know, your career and your facility as you go along. So let's get, um, you know, talk, about some of the business stuff, and then we're going to talk about finances, and then we'll get into a little more, of the, little, what I would say, a little more interesting things. But again, it's very, very broad. So really, from a from a purely business standpoint, there are, fi there are financial opportunities. They're both big and small. And I want to I want to try and talk about this so that it applies to to everyone, no matter what your facility is. You know, again, going back to my time at JC Golf, I was really lucky that we had this broad array of of food and beverage services, you know, whether it's restaurants, the snack bars, the beverage carts, the grab and go walk up windows, banquets, you know, there there's opportunity to learn about high, you know, higher end dining as well and menu generation. And so so there, you know, again it can really impact you on no matter what your operation is. Um so again, think about your operation, think about where this you know fits in. You know, it may be something that you're you're looking to take on, you've been thinking about and you you know you want to explore a little bit further, you know. But again, no pun intended. But don't you know? Don't bite off more than you can chew, because you know food and beverage. I mean, I've seen I've seen a lot of facilities think that they can have a sit down restaurant and maybe they have servers or maybe you know maybe it's people are going to come in and hang out and watch football all you know all weekend. You know, you've got to really know yourself. We'll get back back into that more here in a second. But really, be clear on who you are, what you're trying to achieve. And again, the this this food and beverage, it really keeps you in this constant state of learning. When I, talk, I talked about being able to uh you know watch TV and, and consume that way, but just really be open to learning something new. Um I you know I I love going to a restaurant and reading the menu. Um you know and just and trying to understand how they're doing something and how it could apply to my facility and you know, even taking some of the things that, you know, we do, we do in our house. And again, food and beverage, it, it's a great way to connect with customers. You know, it's your, it's your customers, it's your guests, it's your, the, the non-golfers, the members, you know, for us, even here, we, we've got plenty of non-golfers, but they, you know, they come and hang out with the golfers after the round. Um, they, you know, they're, Again, it's a way for them to spend more time at the facility. It's spending money, and again, I, it doesn't matter whether you're private or public. Whatever your whatever your facility is, is you you know you can have that. You know, that's another way for you to connect with people in your community. You know, there are some you know there are some courses around here. Some of the courses I mentioned earlier too, where people may just go and grab a drink because it's a nice place to be outside. There's a lot of green space. It's you know it's a it's a great place to hang out whether you're playing golf or not. Um, and again, the, the food and beverage can impact your business, your operation. It, it just it can impact your reputation. Um, your reputation is, you know, it's a it's a fun place. It's a it's a cool place. It's easy to go in there. I don't have to feel, you know, I don't feel like I have to be dressed up, you know, like I would if I maybe went to a, a sit down restaurant. Um, you know, those types of things. But again, it's, it's also impacting your brand and brand is something we talk about here on a daily basis and you all should as well it doesn't matter where you are your your brand is who you are and you should protect that you know if you well hopefully it's a good brand and you're happy with the brand but you should protect that brand at all costs all right so again i don't mean to make fun of the financials and and uh say it's less fun but it you know these are some of the things that you do have to worry about before you get into the some of the more exciting things so you know, I, I like to say that the revenues and the profit margins are similar in concept to golf retail shops. So, you know, how are you pricing? Are you keystoning? You know, are you do you have a set margin for everything? So, you know, talking you know, the first first sub bullet, the pricing model. So, 
you know, in whether it's, you know, let's say you're talking about shirts, you know, do your do your market cost change on your shirts? Do they, if you order, you know, if you're ordering a shirt from Peter Millar, is that shirt changing in price that much from season to season? Well, of course you have, you know, changes, you know, prices do go up. But, you know, if you call and say, hey, I need five more of those shirts, typically it's the same, it's the same price as you ordered it, you know, a few months ago. Um, food and beverage, not, not necessarily the case. Um, you know, I can remember, being when I first got to Sherwood right away, there was a, a major avocado shortage to where I think the prices had gone up five times or maybe even more than that. And so the you know the question is, <clears throat> should our prices change? Um, you know, or should you just t- should you have that off the menu? I mean, it's a it's crazy when you start thinking about things, but you know you have to figure out whether you you know whether you just weather that storm or whether you're you know want to be that dynamic. You know, it's it's. You know, it's critical because you got to think about your customers. If you got regular customers coming to play golf, or you have members, and they see the prices change every week and are yo-yoing up and down, you know, it's it's one thing to say you've got you know fish or a piece of meat or something that's market price, but when you know the club sandwich starts changing in price, or you know guacamole starts changing in price every week up and down, it it's a little disconcerting and confusing to the you know to the customer. Um, you know, and again, how do you, what do you, what are you trying to, how are you trying to price? Do you have a standard margin in mind? You know, I think when you talk about your retail operation, you know, I think most of us have, you know, you, you have a, a margin that you're a cost of goods you're trying to reach and, and you mark, you price yourself that way. Now, again, that, but it's, I think it's similar to how most of you will, will price your merchandise. You know, you've got to have, you can approach things with a standard margin, but then you've also got to have some common sense and some, and, and know what your winners are. Um, you know, by common sense is, you know, for instance, like say you're pricing out soup. Now soup's traditionally one of the cheaper things that you, uh, that you might, that you might have out there. So let's say you were trying to have a, an overall cost of good food cost that was going to be 25%. Well, you know, a cup of soup, I mean, is, it's minimal. So it, let's say it costs you, let's say it costs you 25 cents for that cup of soup. Should you be charging a dollar for it? Well, probably not. Probably you can charge closer to, you know, $3. Again, just pick, picking prices out of thin air. So, but likewise, you know, you might have a steak on the menu that, you know, it's got a much higher cost. And let's say it, that, you know, everything on the plate, all in with the steak is $20. You know, could you, could you charge eighty dollars for that plate? Well, also probably not, depending on your environment. So maybe that's where you're, you know, you're charging something in the high forties or mid fifties, and and you're not, t- you're you're taking a little bit of hit on the margin, but again, you're hoping maybe you're maybe there's some volume sales, you know, that goes into the winners. I mean, if you have something that's a lower margin, you sell a ton of it. Okay, that's that's good. That you know, then maybe that's one of your winners, and also. You know, certain items you say, well, I know if somebody's going to sit down and have a steak, then that probably also means there's a bottle of wine that's going to go as well. So, you know, you know, you, can, you try and look at it from big picture, and, and really, you're again, you have to know your business, you have to know your clientele and what they're interested in, and, and how they're going to spend money. The cost of goods, you know, again, very similar to, you know, very similar to um, your retail. You know, kind of sort of going in reverse order. You do have to do inventories. Some, a lot of places, our facility really will do a you know food inventory just a few times a year. It's the the variance is so minimal. It's really not almost not worth the time. Now again, you may have a small enough uh, operation on a snack bar level like we did um, when I was in San Diego. Like we would do a lot of inventories, and you know, so you could really track to see if there was anything that was alarming that was popping up. But also important with that, you know, is storage. And I think some some of our facilities, when we do have a food and beverage operation, where maybe we don't have a proper purchasing area or receive area where we receive food or a cage where you're or store it, dry storage or proper refrigeration, you know, you have to be really cognizant of what the, you know, how you're storing things. Again, just from a accountability standpoint, from a theft standpoint, from a keeping, you know bugs and other critters out of out of what you might be trying to sell um you know the shrinkage point there we you know we don't like to we don't like to think that things walk out the door but you know we know they do um you know sometimes food can be you know can be a uh, a challenging thing i mean you think if you got some 
you know, candy bars in your golf shop. And, you know, it's very easy for whether it's staff or whether it's the clientele to, you know, grab a, grab a candy bar and, or think that, well, I'm missing my lunch break, so I'm going to eat this. So again, you just have to be aware of it. Um, I think you want to, you know, want to have some measures in place. Uh, spoilage is again, another, this is a big difference with, with food and beverage versus retail. Like for the most part, you know, I mean, while we know things go out of style and out of season and, you know, club manufacturers make new clubs, you know, as long as you're buying is, is decent, you know, you're not going to get stuck with too much inventory with food and beverage there, especially on the food side. And when you're dealing with like produce and proteins, that stuff's going bad and you've got to figure out a way to get it out the door. So, um, we're not really getting too much into that here, but you know, you may, you know, you might want to think about, okay, so if we've got such and such a thing, you know, and we know it's got a few more day, only a few more days of useful life, then are we running a special? So again, that's, you're willing to take less of a margin, but something's better than nothing. Um, you know, that also comes in, I don't really get into it in the menu design too much, but, um, you know, what are your other uses for something, you know, can you, if you had a prime rib and you didn't sell all of it, you know, how, what can you, how can you use that, uh, in your food and beverage operation coming up later in the week? Uh, labor again, kind of similar to, similar to what you're doing, you know, you need to establish supervisory and culinary expertise needs. You know, do you have, do you have a need for culinary expertise? Do you, you know, is it a, do you have a hot dog roller? Do you have somebody on the grill? You know, is it a nacho machine, you know, or is it like we're, we've got full tickets coming out, you know, they're getting rung up with a lot of modifications, you know, just whatever you do, that should match, it should match your service and concept. You know, you don't, you don't need an executive chef, again, if you're, if you're going the hot dog roller route, you know, but if you're going with, you know, some nice pastas and proteins and salads and, you know, it's something that you would be, that's a sit down. Well, then, you know, you do need somebody with some kind of culinary expertise. You do need some support systems there. Uh, you know, I, I think of labor flexing similar to cart staff, you know, making sure you've got a labor standard, you know, that, you know, on a Tuesday, you should have roughly this many hours worth of servers or cooks, much like you have this, you know, that many hours of cart staff or pro shop staff. And that it flexes if you know that it's a, it's a holiday or if the weather's or, or, you know, you have some, you know, what I would call variable labor, you know, that you've got, you know, if you're doing a X amount of rounds, you have this baseline amount of labor, but if you're going to do more than that, then the additional labor kicks in. So again, it's, it's for you as facility leaders, but also for the people who report to you, for you to be able to hand something to them and say, okay, here's a guideline, you know, on, on Saturdays, you should have 24 hours worth of server labor and 16 hours worth of cook labor so that somebody can schedule accordingly. Your budget should be built around that. So you, know, you should come up with plans and um, try and execute them. And then if you find something's wrong, then you would, you adjust as you go and you build your budgets differently going forward. You know, the, the other piece on labor and, and uh, you know, and really just kind of how you approach food and beverage, are your food and beverage sales tied solely to your rounds. I think there are some great metrics. We'll talk about metrics at the end, but, you know, do your, does your, if your rounds go up, do your food and beverage sales go up that much? You know, especially if you're in a restaurant environment, you know, how are you going to, you know, how are you staffing or does it really, do your rounds not get impact, impact your food and beverage sales that much? Or do you, because you're, you operate near say an industrial park, where maybe you've got people coming over again, getting the non-golfers, you've got people coming over who aren't playing golf, but they're coming for lunch. And so even though it might be raining outside and you have no golfers, you've still got a busy restaurant. So you have to be, again, that's about being in touch with your, being in touch with your, your business. I think probably for most of us, you know, when you talk about like a lunch business at a golf course and maybe your bar business at a golf course, you're really talking a lot about, it is largely driven by the rounds, but again, it's to each, each of your own. And I'm, I'm always interested to hear about people, how they, how they determine their metrics. And then you're dealing with expenses. Um, you know, there's a very, what varies widely depending on your operation. I think, you know, when you're talking about a snack bar operation or grab and go or something more simple, you're dealing with paper and plastics um, versus a China and glassware, you know, there's, you know, obviously day one, if you're buying paper versus plastic, uh, paper and plastic versus China and glassware, well, paper and plastic is much cheaper, but, you know, you can keep using China and glassware over and over again and, and 
until it breaks, whereas paper and plastic, you have to keep buying and buying and buying. You know, but then with the china and the glassware also comes the need to have dishwashers and make sure you, you know, have somebody who's washing the dishes and, you know, operating a dishwasher. So, again, you're, it just goes back to your brand and who you're trying to be. Um, you know, we've we've had a sort of a, you know, an eye-opening experience here, all of us with COVID and, you know, some of us who may be serving on, China, you know, with china and glassware and all of a sudden it's like, well, you're, we're going to serve everything in plastic and paper and styrofoam and that's the way we have to operate. And then you've got some other things, you've got utilities and the permitting and, you know, maybe capital needs. Um, I won't get too deep into that. Again, these are all lots of big, big picture things. I would just, I will say, I'll probably say this one more time, but the permitting side of it, just make sure you ask some questions. Don't be the place that has a facility that's not properly permitted after having been a at a facility where we've done, had that been an issue. It's not pleasant and it takes a while to recover from it sometimes. Know who you are as, as with everything that we talked about, your brand is the key. You know, don't try and, don't try and be something that you're not. Um, you know, I think there's, you know, again, don't, don't kid yourself. If you've got, you know, if you've got a, Chili's and a Friday's and an in and out down the street, you know, that people are going to all the time, you know, don't try and say you have the best burger, you know, but, but do be, you know, try and figure out who you are, what you can, what you can do. Um, you know, Todd Key for our past president of the section here had a great saying, um, you know, when he talks about food and beverage and he said, he talks about, you know, being the home of something or owning something, you know, and, he talks, you know, we're going to own Friday night. We're going to make sure our members come to us on Friday night. You know, you want to be the home of whatever it is, cold schooners of beer. We're going to be home of the mountain high nachos. We're going to be home of, you know, whatever it might be. And I, and I think you see that a lot of facilities around the country, private as well as public. And it doesn't have to be that, it doesn't have to be that overly creative. Um, you know, it could be that it's a, you know, again, it's something special that people have when they come to your facility. So again, you want to mark, you'd want to be market, you want to market the heck out of it. So again, just be, be clear about what your concept is. Um, you know, you know, it's going to drive, cause then that trickles down. It drives the menu. It drives how you decorate the place. It's going to drive the service style, you know, of, you know, is it a snack bar? Are we, is it just snacks that, you know, we're going to, you can get a snack in, on, uh, in the golf shop, is it grab and go that you can order at the turn? Or is it with a walk up window or is it sit down with server? So again, whatever your concept is, it starts to drive these things. And then most importantly, it drives your budget, you know, the revenues, the cost, the expenses, the labor, um, you know, again, what is, what is your goal? Are you trying to, are you trying to be a restaurant? Probably not for most of us. Um, but you are, you know, you can, you want to make sure that it makes business sense. And who is your, who is really your audience? Um, we talked about, you know, talked about that because is it golfers? Is it the community? You know, again, I know I've heard it over and over again. And again, I was part of the, part of the, this group who would try and fool ourselves sometimes is, oh, I bet you people who live in the community will come over and eat. And again, I think there are those facilities, but I think there's plenty of those facilities where people in their community just don't view us as a restaurant um, when, you know, when you're at a, especially at a public course and they might, they just don't think of you as a, as a place to hang out. So again, figure out what you're trying to do. Um, you know, again, you could potentially own some, some piece of business that you don't really think about, you know, if you have the right furniture, if you have a fire pit, if you've got the right weather in your facility, you know, maybe you, you are, and you've got say TVs with, you know, um, good sound, you know, Maybe you could own Monday nights. Maybe you can get people coming over and watching football. Um, you know, if you're, and if that goes into, if you're well known for something, keep doing it well, you know, don't, don't try and don't deviate from it. Um, you know, I'm, I, I don't like the idea. I'll, I'll talk out of both sides of my mouth. I don't like the idea of being stale and doing the same things over and over and over again and not changing. But if you're, again, if you're that home of something, or if you own some piece of, your little local market, own it and keep owning it. You know, you got to still keep improving upon it and polishing it up, but, you know, make sure you make sure you recognize that that's an important piece of who you are. So again, one of the things we touched on is once you've determined your, you know, what you are, what your concept is, is the menu generation. This is probably my, actually probably my favorite part of my job is being involved in this. Um, 
you know, it's so, again, it's so important to your facility because it's, it's a way people have make, you know, they form an impression of you. So, you know, if people are just coming to dine at your facility, you know, this is like, they, they get the menu. And again, the menu is, it's the last point here too, but that design, it really matters because how does it grab them? Is it, is it formal? Is it exciting? Is it funny? Is it tongue in cheek or what, you know, how are you trying to approach it? Do you have pictures on the menu? Do you have every ingredient listed out there? What, you know, what does it, what does it look like, you know, and how, again, does it match your overall facility? You know, if I'm, you know, again, if I'm at a, at a private club and I have something that looks like in and outs menu, well, that maybe, you know, maybe that doesn't, that doesn't jive, but if I'm, you know, likewise, if I'm, at uh, you know at a facility that's selling burgers and hot dogs, but I try and make my menu look like Ruth's Chris and add all these different things. Well, that, again, that doesn't really make sense either. So, when the menu with the menu generation, who is drive who is driving it? You know, what's your role? You know, it could be that you have that you have a chef who's driving it, that you have a food and beverage manager. Could be you that the, is the drive, key driver of the menu. Um, you know, my recommendation is always to try and have the person or people who are the experts. Um, you know, I was talking to some club managers the other day and actually talking to some members from another club and, you know, they were taught, I was telling them how we do things at, at our club and they were talking about the fact that their committee of members really drive the menus. And I, again, for those of you at private clubs or those of you even, another way of uh, talking about it is those of you dealing with owners, you got they shouldn't be driving the menu the menu should be driven by really driven by the people who can produce it because the worst thing you can do to a chef or a cook or a food and beverage manager is say here's what you're doing and then have they have to go figure it out now i think you should be part of the conversation you if you're in a leadership role or or even if you're even if you're not in a leadership role you need to this is something i want to make sure i get across insert yourself into the conversation um, for me, as an example, like when I was at Four Seasons, I had certain food and beverage responsibility, but then there was some more global food and beverage responsibility. And I would, I would ask to be part of those meetings, talking about the, the major planning and menu generation, and you know how they're approaching food and beverage. And everybody was always happy to let me in because I was just I would sit and I would ask a few questions and I would learn. So you should be part of that. So, again, try and let the people who are going to producing these menus and having to you know serve everybody let them have a major role in driving it but you you do have to if you're the leader and you're you're overseeing them you do have to steer that ship because sometimes they can get overzealous uh, with what they're trying to do so where where is your in inspiration coming from well you've got trends and fads you know, and again i think the golf and club industry in general is slow to react to a lot of the trends that are going on in the marketplace um, but again, try and keep your eyes open, try and, you know, try to, fads are challenging, I mean, fads are fine, but trends, you know, usually it has to do more with diet or how people are buying food, you know, is it, you know, as opposed to, like, as opposed to, you know, these, this mass produced thing, it's coming from a farm now and things like that. Also, travel and dining out, you know, that's where, for me, a lot of my, you know, my Advice with my wife is that we travel, and you know that's what we, so we try and get inspiration from different different things that we do, and it's it's the food and it's also the beverage. I'll come back to the beverage here in a, in a few slides, and then just, just dining out. Like, what are you seeing that other restaurants are doing? Um, you know, we we got a concept at, from Wood Ranch Barbecue, where you know, when my youngest son, who's now nine, but when he was about, I think when he was about two or three. He would sit down. They would ask if he had any allergies. We'd say no, and they'd bring him a plate with like some crackers and I think some Cheerios and um, an orange slice and some bananas. And it was literally they brought it right away. They gave him some crayons, and he was occupied and busy. And I thought it was the most brilliant touch because it probably cost them, you know, again now their place like Wood Ranch is doing volume, so they're not worried about you know a few bananas or or oranges going bad, but. I just thought it was so brilliant because they knew if we can keep the child happy and engaged that the that the parents are going to stick around. Maybe they have an extra drink. Maybe they get a dessert, whatever. They're not rushing out with a young child. So, again, try and steal these things when you can um, from other places. And then, you know, when you're when you're building your budget and, you, you know, you're looking at doing these things, if, if possible, 
you know, if you're the one doing it or your own, you know, talk to your owner, try and budget in the, some eating out so that you can go and see some of the competition so that you can understand what they're doing. It's also a great way to do some, have some team building. You know, we have some of our food and beverage managers. We have some of our, some of our servers. Um, definitely our cooks will try and take out from time to time so they can see some of the restaurants where our members dine. Because I think it's, it's really difficult when, you, you know, it's for certain operations for people to identify where the clientele is eating. Um, so again, if you can budget, build that, some of that in your budget, do that, you know, who's your target audience, um, you know, in the menu, menu generation, you know, if you if your target audience is a lot of guys who are drinking beer and, you know, want to watch football, well, you're probably not going for a lighter menu. You know, again, you're going to be on the heavier things and you're going to be your go-to, the hot dogs and hamburgers, the nachos, you know, things like that, you know, or is again, or is it, do you have a lot of, you know, maybe you have an older group of people, maybe you have a lot of ladies, so you have to think about certain dietary needs or preferences that way. And then balance is important. Um, you know, again, sometimes you, some some places it's more important. I think if you're in a more of a sit-down restaurant, the balance of the menu is important that you make sure there's good representation of, you know, some heavier items, some lighter items, you know, and that you're, you've got proper, you know, proper uh, representation on like the protein side as well. Um, and then the financial approach when you're generating that menu, how, again, we talked about that. How are you pricing? But what are the goals? Like, and that's an important question you've got to ask yourself. Again, it goes back to the brand of, you know, who are you? What are you trying to do? Well, what are your goals with, with food and beverage? You know, when you talk about, you know, when you talk about public facilities, I think the goal with any food and beverage, no matter what it is, is you want to make a little bit of money. Um, with with a goal with private clubs, a lot of private clubs are lo are big losers in food and beverage, and which is kind of surprising. It was eye opening to me as I I got more into the private world, coming from a you know for profit facilities. You know I think, but a lot of that ties. You have to remember the, those private facilities are also they're charging uh, dues to their members, so those members are paying a dues. And what do you get for your dues? Well, part of it is just access to your your golf club or golf course, but Another part of that is that, you know, some of the concept is, you know, you're paying dues so you can always have your restaurant open and available and that you have a have a reasonable, reasonably priced drink and a reasonably priced meal. So a lot of the, a lot of those facilities, if you if you break it down, will be losers in food and beverage. But when you, you know, when you break down and break it down into a subsidy from the dues that goes back to food and beverage, you know, you're overall you know, you're still trying to be in the in the profit business. Um, and then we touched on menu design a little bit, you know, but it, it's, you know, what are the colors you're using? Are you, you know, how are you, how are you placing certain items on the menu? Again, there's a lot of information on the internet. I won't, I won't get into it right now. And that would be a, it'd be a good topic for another day to talk about, you know, where you put, you know, your high margin items on the menu, where you maybe hide your lower margins, you know, where you put your, put the, the, the winners that people are buying over and over again where you're getting a smaller margin, but they're, you know, they're their go-to items, that type of thing. So again, really interesting on the menu design piece of it. Um, beverages, you know, we're, this is again, really getting more and more interesting all the time. Um, you know, from a, from a financial standpoint, sodas, you know, fascinating because I think most of us, you know, when we're in our homes, we're buying, you know, you're buying cans of soda, um, you know, but then you've also got when you're at a facility, you've got these options for you know soda fountains, or you some of you have probably seen them, or maybe not don't know how they work, but they're you know basically boxes with bags of syrup in them that connect to your fountain, and then they're mixing with the the soda water, and voila, there's your there's your soda. But there and there's incredibly high margins on when you're using the fountains. Um, you know, I think that's you know you want to go that way, but then you've also got to think of the practicality of do you have the plumbing for a so you know a fountain machine you know do you, is there is does that fit your operation you know because if you've got a if your if your soda sales are coming out of your golf shop then you're probably just using a small you know small refrigerator in there um you know again just some of it again you have to balance the ease with with you know the pra the practicality with the you know the margin as well so just you know think about that kind of thing um you know, beer is were sort of similar on the craft versus the cans and bottles. Um, you know, again, you can get into all, all kinds of all kinds of different things here. I, with beer, you know, I, I think you start if you're not doing beer, but you have the right license to do it. Again, let's let me reiterate. Please make sure you've got the right licenses to do, um, you know, to do what your, you know, to do what your facility allows you to do or what you're trying to do. Um, but you know, there's so much. 
opportunity with beer. You know, you know so many local breweries that are that are out there. You know, it's something that people get interested into. Um, you know, for here, us here in uh, Ventura County and Thousand Oaks, we've got Tarantula Company. You know, that has become a cool spot to go hang out. Well, it's a little different now with COVID, but you, cause you, at least you can sit outside. But they've got a great indoor facility as well. You know, they've got food. It's a big, big, big place to be on Friday and Saturday nights. And so there's a recognizability with, you know, having that local local beer, you know, in your in your snack bar, in your restaurant on your course um wine is another you know is another uh thing you know it's it's kind of an interesting thing you know i don't know you know i we've had it at some of our private facilities you can do some small bottles of it so that you're not you know, don't think you don't want to have a big inventory unless you know unless you really churn out um a lot of wine you know we do we have a license that allows us to sell wine off you know basically to go off site and so we do you know this is kind of a crazy number we do about half a million dollars in those sales um each year with with a with a lower margin because it's a service to the members and you know they know that if they really wanted a shop they could go find it for probably a similar price so it's you know again it's a service to the membership um but you've got to think about what kind of inventory you want to you want to carry um and then you know now wine on tap has become a a thing that you see, start to see more and more places and then Coravin where you know it's basically for those of you who don't know what it is you can look it up but it's basically a needle that goes into the bottle so you can uh pour out of the bottle and not you know not oh you haven't had to take the cork out so the want the bottle will last for quite a bit longer so it's it's another it's a good thing to do with um especially if you've got some higher end wines that you don't want that you want to be able to sell by the glass um, but you don't want to open the whole bottle up. So, again, that's a whole other whole other um, program which we should do some education on some wines. Really fascinating, and I think from from a club manager standpoint, I think that's the thing that surprised me the most. That I I am still lacking in my knowledge, and it's probably near near to the top of my to dos is improving my wine knowledge. As you're, it's a it's a great way. Again, from a sales standpoint, it's great. From a connecting with members and clients, it's a great it's a great thing to have knowledge about um just for me it's been not my thing but so i've really got to force myself um sounds kind of funny when you talk about this like what you need to work on is drinking wine uh beverages continuing so spirits you know again another thing so a lot of the a lot of your licenses that you'll have you may be able to get a beer and wine license a spirit license is you know something that's a little more uh a little more in depth to get you know how are you doing what are your if you're doing cocktails let's say you have the that license to sell hard alcohol hard liquor you know what are you doing with the cocktails you know what's your inventory looking like what's your selection depth you know and what i mean by that is how many vodkas do you really need how many rums do you really need uh you know you got to know your audience you know if somebody you know if, if i'm you know if i'm building a facility that's, you know, more of a snack bar, you know, not a high end, you know, it's, you've probably got, you know, it's probably Captain Morgan and, you know, and then you've got like a Tito's and you've got just a handful of things, you know, cause look, people will have their favorite types of spirits, but in lieu of not them, you not having their favorite type, they'll probably just take what you have. So think about that. You know, you've also got to, you know, think about, you know, you go into some of these places like a, Again, like think of the steakhouses like a Ruth's Chris or a Mastro's, and they have this amazing array of bottles. Again, that's probably not most of our facilities. Um, you know, it's not ours. I mean, we have a couple bars that have some level of, of uh, spirits lined up, but it's nothing like those facilities. Now, the good thing is with spirits is they really don't go bad. Um, so, you know, there, there's a huge shelf life, so you don't have to know, have to worry too much about it. Uh, something that's come that I really personally you, enjoy and it's great for golf is the pre-made or the pre-made cocktails that are you know especially that they're coming in cans and that's that balance of the ease of having the pre-made cocktail versus maybe the profit of you having the uh you know pouring the cocktails themselves and using your mixer so just you can think about some of that um you know again also with the ease if you're doing if you have a beverage cart or you have um coolers on your cart so that your golfers can buy buy these pre-made cans it's, it makes it really easy and again don't have to worry about the, in, the inventory is a lot easier than trying to measure bottles um, and also kind of bleeds in the next point it, it takes away some of the the guesswork of that mixology of your staff like how well trained is your staff um, you know it's it's a 
poorly made drink is really not great, whereas a you know a really well made drink is fantastic. Now again, are you having this hipster bartender with handle handlebar mustaches behind your bar, or is it the college kid who's like, okay, how much rum do I put in this Captain and Coke? You know, you've got to be just again aware of your your limitations. And then, you know, there are some trends in beverages. And then the one thing that just I've seen at golf courses lately, again, here, seeing at some of the public courses where I've been lately, is are the seltzers, the hard seltzers. Um, you know, the big popular one is the, you know, we see White Claw all the time. I mean, it's shocking, and it doesn't matter who it is, it, you know, men, women, older, younger. I think it's, a, you know, people view these seltzers as great beverages that they can drink while it's hot outside. And, you know, they can... Uh, you know, it doesn't fill you up and it's keto and friendly and low carb friendly from a diet, dietary standpoint. So again, just something to think about, um, you know, just an, another thing, but going back to the, uh, the spirits and the wine, you know, and you can have to talk to your local ABC rep and some of your distributors, but I know there were some courses where we were who didn't have a hard alcohol license, but there were some, um, there were some Japanese wines that were kind of on the sake spectrum but they were really more of a vodka type of cocktail so you could make a variety of cocktails with things that were that were did qualify as wines but you could call them you know sort of call them something else so just again you're trying to be creative as you can with whatever licensing you have but that goes into those liabilities of making sure you've got and the permits making sure you got the right permits making sure you've got staff training you know it's i don't want to gloss over this because you you know you really do need to have have staff that are trained to serve alcohol to look for signs of intoxication. Uh, again, this is a this is a major major thing that I'm going to talk about for 25 seconds. So, spend the time, spend a little bit of money. Again, this is when you're making these decisions about what you're going to do at your facility. Make sure you've got the right training in place. Um, snacks, the beverage carts. We've talked about a lot of this already. You know, keep it keep it fairly simple. You know who's doing the ordering, you know, um, again, you can get certain people get overzealous with the ordering. Um, it's, it's very easy to avoid, you know, spoilage. So, you know, on a beverage cart, cause it's, you know, you, a lot of that stuff doesn't spoil. It can be not as easy to avoid shrinkage. You know, sometimes you beverage cart driver gets tipped a little extra and all of a sudden a little bit extra goes off the cart. Um, you know, so how do you handle, handle your inventories? Where do you store things? You know, that's one of those things that I know at our facilities in San Diego, there was always a concern about the beverage cart getting broken into or the cart barn got broken into. And they weren't really looking for anything but to get the alcohol in the beverage cart. Um, and again, it's that it's that staff training and safety uh, of driving a beverage cart. So the the safety aspect being like knowing that somebody knows how to drive around turns and the golf course going down the hills and realizing that that doesn't handle like a regular beverage cart or a regular golf cart, but also like just the etiquette of that they're not driving, you know, it's a, usually a gas powered vehicle. So they're not driving up in the middle of a group who's um, about to tee off or putting out things like that. And, and there are facilities who have got opted for a route of just having versus a moving cart, having a stationary cart. Um, the best example I heard of, which blew my mind when I heard it about four years ago, was that Augusta National actually has a beverage cart. I think they might even have two. And if you know the course, 10 green is sort of also near 15 T. So you, I think they would park one over there. They might even park one on the front line. I can't remember, but they would park one there so that people could get something as their sort of that was their turn stop. So kind of an interesting thing. Again, just thinking about way, you know, creative ways to solve to solve problems. Um, and then some of the other stuff, just when you're, again, from the circling back to the financial piece, the, you know, budgeting and financial metrics are very similar to golf. So covers are like rounds. What is your cost per cover? You know, it takes, so you could take, you can go do it labor per cover. And again, cover being a dine, sorry, I should have said cover being someone who's dining. And usually, usually if somebody just buys a drink, we wouldn't count that as a cover, but uh, cover being someone who orders some type of food, um, but again, whatever your whatever your facility does, you, you know there can be different different definitions of what a cover is. But then you know use your use your covers to give you those metrics. Is how much? What is my labor per cover in food and beverage? What is my cost per cover of you know your other items? What is your all-in cost per cover? What is the average check? And again, usually average check is, you know, again when you've got a cover on somebody eating, how much are they spending? So if you know there's two entrees, you've got 
two covers there and then add up all the food and beverage and desserts and there, you know, all the bits and pieces, that's your average check. So again, these are really important metrics that you want to want to know um, and be able to talk about if you're not already talking about them. Um, just to, again, show your intelligence, show your concern for your facility. In your dining rooms, just again, some other things to think about. Do you take do you take reservations or not? You know, if you're again, for most of us, we don't need reservations. But you know, nowadays with COVID, it's all almost everything we do is reservations. So you know, even I know some of my friends who I was talking to the other day in Northern California, like every meal period is breakfast, lunch, and dinner. We we started that way too with COVID. We haven't needed to do it so much for breakfast and lunch, but they require there's no walk-in business at their facility. So you know, think about that. You know how do you how do you uh, how do you turn your the room? So it's, again, it's almost like how how long does a round of golf take? How quickly can you turn a table? Um, you know, again, every facility is different. If you got people, if you got a facility that's built to get people to come in and drink and linger for a while, that's to, you know that you need to understand that you how many people can you fit in there and how many people can you reasonably reasonably get through in a day? You know, also thinking about your number of golfers and rounds. So, you know, that impacts what you're trying to do with your menu. It impacts what you're, you know, how your kitchen is running, how you're buying food, that type of thing. Banquets, again, a, a whole other topic for another day, but, you know, just know what works. You know, my, my favorite thing when I was officing uh, with JC at Twin Oaks in San Marcos is, you know, I would always talk to our tournament sales director about, well, why don't you sell them this? And why don't you sell them that? And talk about the different packages. And he looked at me and said, Rob, it's the Mexican buffet and a keg of beer. Let's not overthink this. We we know we do it well. We know it works. Just keep doing it. And great. And it was all right. And and it was it was actually brilliant. You know when I heard him say that. You know so again think if you do something really well and you can own that or you're known for that, just keep doing it. You know try and improve on it as time goes on. You know with banquets there's there's a lot of other stuff that comes along. You know do you need uh, props for theme banquets. Do you need special furniture, you know, or do you need folding chairs and banquet tables? Also, do linens come into play? Do you have to have special equipment because now you have to, you know, fire up a pizza oven because it's an Italian buffet, or do you have to have an outdoor grill or a smoker that you don't normally use for your operation? So again, think about some of the different things you might use for bigger banquets, and if that's a business you want to get into. And then you've got the your cleanliness, the inspections, responsibilities, and why I said parents and orphans. Because when things go wrong, it's that's an orphan. wasn't wasn't my responsibility. But when things go right, you know, like everybody's everybody's a parent, and they're proud of it. So just make sure that there's there's clear roles and responsibilities that you should have for everything at your facility, no matter where it is. Who's responsible for it? Who's ultimately responsible for it? Who oversees the people in that area? Um, and just again, because it is so important. I mean, food and beverage. You're talk you are talking about health. And you do have to make sure you pass those inspections to keep your permit, you know, your permits going. So just make sure that you've got uh, you've got all those things in place. And uh, John, I don't know if you've got going to have any questions today, but um, there's my information below, uh, my direct line, my cell phone. You can always call any of those numbers or shoot me a text or an email. I'm happy to help in any way I can. I don't claim to be an expert, but I do claim to be someone who knew nothing, and now I feel like I know quite a bit. So, John, thank you again for letting me speak today, and uh, let me know if there's anything else, if there's any other questions right now. Thank you very much, Rob. A wonderful presentation. Definitely some questions. Uh, obviously, the role of a food and beverage operation at a public golf course or a resort is different from that of, uh, of an equity club uh, or a member-owned club uh, in terms of profitability versus quality of service. Can you talk a little bit about the role of the general manager or, in your case, the COO, uh, in terms of communicating the realities to the uh, board of directors on managing the expectations on profitability and service versus price point? Oh, that's whoever gold star for whoever asked that question. I should have sent that question in myself. Um, yeah, it's 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 important. It's hugely important, and you have to make sure, especially with a rotating um, board of governors, where you might, you know, at our facility we have three new and three off each year off of our off of our board of nine, and almost every year it's an education for people. Um, you know, you like to you like to try and educate the membership as a whole. Um, you try and use your committee systems to educate those, the, the committee members of what you, you know, what your goals are financially, so that they understand 
where you, what your goals are, but also why your goals are what they are in terms of food and beverage loss. Um, another thing, if you can, if you can find it, um, and there's a, if anybody wants this, I'll email this to you. There's a great white paper that just got written. Um, those of you, some of you might know Monterey Peninsula Country Club up, uh, in Monterey, inside 17 Mile Drive. Um, JJ West, great general manager there. They've gone to a totally new food and beverage model where they're actually designing it almost to lose more money but it's being covered by the dues. But it's really like, I'm really oversimplifying this, but let's just say there's no food and beverage minimum and the margins are almost none in, in food and beverage, but your dues have gone up. And what's happened is, is people go, because it's a cheap place to eat. Yes, they're paying a little bit higher dues that are subs that's subsidizing the, the food and beverage, but it's now a really, really active place, like packed. Um, because the food and beverages is, is so inexpensive. So I think you want to, you know, there, so there's a white paper that he wrote, uh, the JJ along with um, a company called Club Benchmarking. Um, they've got some resources online, some you do have to have a subscription for, but I can send anybody who wants this white paper, if you send me an email, um, it'll talk a lot about about food and beverage and some of the reasons why it loses money, but also just there is there's a correlation too. I think with you know as your really as your club charges higher dues, it's almost like you lose more money because um, I think I think it ties into expectations, it ties into hours of operation. You know the bigger I mean we we're talking about opening another outlet at our club, and I've been very clear that that's a great idea, but just let's make sure we build in more loss. And I know that sound it's so counter um, it's so counter to what you know we're all used to is you know, is that, you know, we should be making money off of, we're doing things to make money. Well, we are, but you all, with a private club, I think you have to have the context of you're doing things. You know, I say I'm in two kinds of business. I'm in the dues business and I'm in the entertainment business. And part of being in the entertainment business is using the dues part of the business to entertain people and entertaining a lot of it. And most of it has to do with food and beverage. Um, so, you know, I think, I think you just, you have to talk in terms that members understand, you know, and, and again, we, we bring in outside consultants for those of you who are working in private clubs. If you haven't done this, there's a number of outside consultants to come in for whatever reason, but somebody else's voice always seems to resonate more than yours when it comes to talking to a board. But I, I think when you, you know, you get you, the danger at a private club is the guy who says, well, he's a part owner at a restaurant or he's got a friend who owns a restaurant. Yeah, that's their business. And then, what I always remind them is that business is open to the entire world. My business is open to 600 membership families. So it's very limited in how we, you know, in who our, who our audience is. Um, you know, there's all kinds of things. I think this white paper is pretty good. Um, but again, there's, there are lots of resources out there. Um, I'm happy to talk through and talk through some of it with, with what I've done. You know, I think when you start to explain to people, what you know what you're doing and you get some committees and you're or a finance committee involved and you explain what's happening you know it there's going to be levels of frustration where they just say well i just disagree well that's fine you disagree but i've got data you need to get the data to support your argument or not argument to support your position because the data the data plays lays it out that you know that's i mean there are clubs there are clubs in the in southern california that everybody on this call knows and they are seven figure losers in food and beverage and they don't mind. And that is the way they're built year in and year out. Any other questions, John? Uh, yes. Um, fabulous answer. That was my question, Rob. I do have to, I do no, have to gold you, star I, for you. All right. Take the rest totally of the day off. Selfishly motivated because uh, here in my position, I do spend a fair amount of time, um, policing food and beverage because that's the the hardest the hardest department to to provide consistent service uh, day in day out because you know your staff uh, a lot of the frontline uh, teammates are are not committed to the to long term health of of yeah. the club they just you know are, want a part time job to make tips and stuff so um, but not, that was my question selfishly motivated for sure another question coming at you personally what is your worst food and beverage nightmare story as a general manager that you've experienced? Um, well, the easy one is, is that uh, there's a facility where I worked, where I started working and unbeknownst to me, there was a, there was a, um, a bar on the property that was not properly permitted. And I had no idea about it. I would have never thought about it. 
and I think it was sort of from a prior regime. And so in early, early on, we actually had a health inspection and then the, you know, health inspector stumbled upon this and said, there's no records or this. And so that would mean that was a whole nightmare of trying to deal with that. Um, oh, this is a good question. What's my biggest nightmare? Um, you know, I think, um, I think trying to, you know, that's a, that's a tough one. I'd have to think about, it. I mean, there's, there's certainly time. Well, okay. I'll think about a recent one where we did uh to go Easter um, here at the club and it was, or sorry, rather mother's day at the club. And it was really the first thing we tried to do um, during COVID and we bit off way more than we can chew. And, it just it was a nightmare because it's a big day and you've got people lined up you know, pulling up to pick up their food and the you know the weights got out of control and you know and just what you do about it, i mean you you acknowledge it you just have to acknowledge after the fact and there's a lot of stories and you know again fortunately we were dealing with a lot of empathy and compassion from the membership because they knew what we were that we were trying to pull something off i mean i think we did something crazy like 500 covers or something you know, so sort of serving 500 meals um, in doing something we'd never done before like that in to, with to go. And, um, you know, that was just, that's a recent nightmare. I mean, fortunately, knock on wood, we haven't dealt with people really getting sick from food. I know that's, you hear that from some clubs where they get something bad or, you know, there's a virus or something that goes around from a buffet. Um, but, you know, those types of things. But yeah, that's a, that's one that sticks out recently. Um, you know, sort of an ongoing nightmare is trying to make sure you have enough staff um, in the in the various areas. It's a tough time to hire. You know, with minimum wage going up, um, you know, I think it's a tough it's a tougher market. You know, more and more jobs are paying more and more. So, from a server standpoint, it can be really challenging. Thank you, um, Rob. I uh, got two minutes past the nine o'clock hour. I don't have any more questions that have come in want to thank you for your time and putting this together today. Uh, extremely educational. Thank you very much, Rob, for being on the Catalyst webinar series. For those that are also on the webcast this morning, uh, we no longer require the quiz for the uh, PGA members that are on the live webcast. You get your one MSR point automatically. Uh, the quiz is still out there and attached to the YouTube recording on the SCPGA website to access after the fact. Um, and uh, Rob, thanks a lot for being on the Catalyst webinar this morning. Thanks, John. Thanks, everybody. Take care, everybody. Until okay. next week, stay safe, stay sane. Okay.